Welcome to today's episode of the Lady Landlords podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about private lending, and we have Hillary, one of our members and experts in the group, joining us today. Hillary, thanks so much for hopping on today. Thanks for having me, Becky. Okay. You're welcome. So um, you wanted me to talk a little bit about me, right? Yes. Can you introduce yourself for us? Yeah. So I'm Hillary Romero. I am part of Lady Landlords Facebook. I not really, I don't really, really remember how I found the group, but I've been really <laughs> blessed to be part of it. And I love to help when I can answer questions that I know how to answer to the ladies. And um, anyway, so a little bit about me. I am here in San Antonio, Texas. My husband and I actually do a little bit of everything here in real estate. We um, have a wholesale company called Hilco Homes. We've been doing that for about six years. We also have our investment portfolio called Bella Buyers. I mean, we're constantly buying and selling properties. So I would think, at, I think at this point we're around 25 properties, but it, it fluctuates all the time. So I can't really keep track of that. We have two small multifamilies, a seven plex and a five plex. The rest are single family. And uh, we do pretty much just buy and hold investments. Right now, no flipping. We will consider flipping into the future, but we have a strategy around how we do things. And then I'm also a realtor. So I'm, a, I'm also going for my broker's license. So soon enough here, I'll, I'll oh, be wow. a broker. So I kind of do a little bit of everything and um, <laughs> it's fun though. I like having options, right? And I think that's really great. I think in today's market, we need to think about different income streams and we need to think about what we can do to make sure that if things change and fluctuate, that we can still be bringing in the money that we expect. So I think that's a really... That's a great setup. And one of the other things that I really love that you said when you mentioned how many properties you currently own, you made sure that like it wasn't really kind of clear. It wasn't like kind of top of mind, which is great because as a reminder, we want to make sure that we're thinking about things beyond just the number of doors we have. All because somebody has one more door than you do does not mean that they are better than you, that they're a better investor than you, or even that they're making more money than you. Right. So I, I think what I like about your story is that you have things that are going on that make up kind of that profile. And it's not just so, okay, I need to get that one next door because once I make that next door, then that's it. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great way to show that there are other things you can do in real estate. Right. Um, so you said you got into real estate about six years ago. I, I did. Uh, so my husband, Marco, he's been in real estate a lot longer than me. When I met him, he was actually already in it for several years. And so he actually at the time was an, a realtor as well. And he mm -hmm. serviced a lot of investor clients, which is how he learned how to find the deals. So investing okay. in market ready homes as like an agent for straight buyers and sellers are like, it's like a whole new world. So Marco really learned um, how to evaluate investment properties because he was mm -hmm. finding deals for his investors. So it was free knowledge for him, free education. And he just helped close the, the deal at the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. when I met him, he was also wholesaling independently. That was back when wholesaling wasn't really that big. No one really knew of it. There wasn't a lot of competition going on, at least not here in San Antonio. And so mm -hmm. I remember, uh, meeting him and being like, you do what? I have to go to my job. It's like 6am <laughs> fighting traffic, not really liking what I do, but he's like laying in bed, making deals happen. And I was like, I don't know if this is legal, but it, <laughs> it is at least in our state. It is. I know it's not allowed everywhere. In your state. Yes. Can you just tell then our viewers really quickly what wholesaling is? Because I'm sure that there's other ladies out there thinking the same thing that you started with, which is what even is this? So wholesaling <laughs> is really where you find sellers who are, they're typically distressed sellers. Uh, they could mm -hmm. be distressed, like they live in a distressed property. They could be financially distressed, emotionally distressed. There's a number of reasons why somebody would want to sell their property at a discount. It could be um, they inherited a property from a person or loved one who's passed away. They, and it's such in disarray that they can't really, they know they're not going to be able to sell it for top dollar mm -hmm. with an agent, or they don't have the fees to pay an agent. I mean, you have to pay typically 6% is standard. It just gets mm -hmm. it's just sometimes overwhelming for people. So they'll just decide to sell it at a discount. And um, us as wholesalers, we're kind of like the middleman in between the transaction between the buyer and the seller. So you you contract the property with the seller, and then you turn mm -hmm. around and sell your equitable interest of that contract to the back end investor. And because you're buying it at a discount, or you're contracting it at a discount, um, it still makes sense for the buyer on the back end to usually they're flippers, they'll flip the property and then sell it and make a profit. And it's kind of like everybody mm -hmm. wins, honestly. So that's it is. 
about what wholesaling is. It's a quick way. I like to say it's flipping paper because you're <laughs> essentially flipping a property quickly for, for money, but you're not really at major risk in the deal. Um, we usually put just $10 earnest money down. So if the deal goes south or whatever, something falls apart or the seller doesn't commit, we're not really losing a whole lot of money out of that. And then, um, yeah, at the end okay. of the day, you can make a pretty big, big spread. You can make anything. I mean, it doesn't, there's no limit. So it's really nice. Yeah. I think that's one, one of the important things that we need to think about as well. A lot of people you'll see in the group kind of saying like, oh, I'm trying to find a deal. I'm trying to find a deal. Um, and they're usually looking for that deal for a specific strategy, right? They're either, you know, my specialty is the buy and hold, other people are flippers. So they usually can tend to be looking for a particular type of property, a deal that fits the strategy that they work with. And right. sometimes you want to actually kind of reverse that and say, well, let's go find the deal and then figure out what to do with it. Sometimes it's looking at those numbers and saying, let's actually wholesale this. Um, sometimes you look at it and you say, oh, this is perfect. I'm going to take this on as flipping myself. And sometimes you say, you know what, this will be great as a buy and hold and just be able to rent it out. So right. I think it's really a great skill and kind of a great extra weapon to have in your pocket, just being like, let me just go find the deals. Let me go figure out where these just, just sellers are. Let's put the process in place for that. And then once we have that, once we have the numbers, then you can kind of look at it and say, well, what do I do with it now? Do exactly. I wholesale it? Do I flip it? Or do I keep it? And rent we, it, so. uh, we, we have a lot of connections here in San Antonio. So we have deals coming to us all the time. And I have, you know, my own investor clients as a realtor where I might not want the property or I know a certain investor is looking for the specific property. And so yeah. I'm just like, what deals can I find? Who <laughs> can I pass them to? Is it going to like, is it one I want to buy? Do I have the capital ready to go? Do I buy it? Do I wholesale it? Do I be a realtor? I mean, I love having the opportunity to do whatever works for the deal. Yeah. But I also think that COVID, um, just to touch on COVID, I think that was also mm -hmm. a pivotal point where when, when something like a pandemic happens, you kind of have to have all the tools in the tool belt to be able to say, okay, well, this might not work very well right now, but I can go focus on these, these aspects of real estate. And so my husband yeah. and I have a lot of conversations and you know, our wholesale kind of went down a little bit in COVID, but like my agencies picked up. So I don't know, it just, it just depends on the time of day, but I love having all the options. Once again, reasons to have multiple streams of income. And there's nothing wrong with also still kind of having like that focus and say, this is kind of our bread and butter, but still understanding how to flip flop, especially, you know, with worldwide pandemics going on, that's clearly going to be a rather big asset. Um, Another thing you kind of see in the group all the time is people saying, well, I'm a little bit afraid to rent right now during COVID. I'd rather leave my apartment empty and just let it sit there. I'd rather wait to buy, you know, maybe there'll be a downturn in the market, housing prices will drop. And those are all things we really kind of can't predict. But the way that you set up your business, Hillary, has the options that kind of regardless of where things go, you're kind of ready. Yeah. So, I mean, well there's, there's well definitely the... Uh... The, the risk in anything real estate, right? But as far Any as like, investment, exactly. But I mean, as far as the pandemic goes, if I have a property that I have to pay my lenders on, I mean, yeah, there's always the risk that I'm going to put a bad tenant in there or they're not going to pay. Um, and the moratorium is going to continue to be shut down <laughs> where you can't evict. But I mean, we just try not to operate in the fear mindset. And just when we okay. do put the tenant in, we make sure that they, if, if like there's any kind of iffiness about them, we'll collect extra deposit just to kind of mitigate that risk that we take on. Um, but we have had, you know, a couple of issues, but overall, <laughs> I mean, spread out on all the properties we have, we've, we still try and or we still come out ahead. That's why you have to make sure the numbers make sense. And I know that there's a lot mm -hmm. of investors right now that are forcing deals to work, which I really, I really consider you all to, if you're doing that, to consider not to do that because that's where you really get burned is if you try and force a deal to work because you're desperate to get a property and say you're an investor, that's really where you will go wrong. If you do have a scenario where a tenant is put in your property and then they can't pay and now it's six months in and they're, you know, they're just sitting there. Um, mm -hmm. You have to really be mindful of all of the aspects of when you're purchasing a property to make sure that you're always in the best possible outcome. Exactly. And honestly, it's not just during a worldwide pandemic that we shouldn't push for deals happening. Um, exactly. You know, I invest in New York. It's very competitive. It is very, it tends to be rather expensive over here. Well, I'm still in the Dominican Republic, 
but <laughs> um, in New York, um, it does tend to be very expensive. And you see people that have just been looking for a property and looking for a property that they kind of stretch what they know is the right numbers for that deal, just because they want to be able to get moving and get that deal. And they just kind of get frustrated. And you're seeing that more and more now that we're almost kind of bending numbers to make things work. And that's not how math works, right? We need to really make sure that we're listening to what the numbers tell us and kind of go with that. So definitely a good reminder for everybody out there to kind of have a little bit of patience. We're all kind of in the same boat. Always be looking, always be doing your numbers, but really listen to what the numbers tell you. Don't change the numbers to make it fit what you really want to have happen. So that's a, that's a great, that's a great reminder to point out. So was it your husband then that got you into real estate in general? Yes. So he, when, when he told me about what he was doing, I was working my typical nine to five job. I was a project manager and I was really mm -hmm. good at it. Actually, I'm really good at like the, when it comes to like closing files, cause it's all kind of the same thing. You're managing your project, you're managing your file to get mm -hmm. to the closing table. So I'm really good at that. I'm very organized and detailed and I keep to my timeline. So that's what I was doing, but I wasn't necessarily passionate about it from the perspective of like having to go to work. Like I like doing it when it's for myself, but I don't, I don't like being ruled by the nine to five. Totally agreed. Um, I'm in the absolute same boat. Now, when you say we were a project manager, was it for an industry related to real estate at all that you were project manager? No, it was a no, nothing. It was a, no, it was a project management position for, um, an electronic health record where we would take oh. people with paper files, like mom and pop <laughs> hospitals and doctors, like just one-off doctors who were looking to like come to the 21st century with like yep. technology. And so I would basically introduce myself as their go-to person, um, yep. tell them the whole process from start to finish, collect all the paperwork, schedule the trainers, trainings with the all the different nurses and uh, doctors. And then mm -hmm. I also talk with the development team to make sure that their interfaces were going smoothly. And so there's a lot of customizations within the system. Yeah. That's where they get with their trainers. It was just a big thing. And so no. the key, <laughs> he was to hit the go live date. And it was yep. very hard because I'd work with like maybe one or two people in one project and then maybe like 15 different locations with like hundreds of dollars. I mean, it was just chaos. And <laughs> I didn't get paid enough for it and it was really stressful. And so when my husband was like, hey, I think it's okay if you just quit your job. My pl the plan was for me to quit my job and there was no plan. Um, my plan wasn't actually to go into real estate. It was just yeah. to quit my job and and, and just so y'all are aware, I actually have a BFA, a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Um, I graduated from a private art school and um, the thought process was for me to go back and just like do back, go back to art or go mm -hmm. work from a gallery or somehow just get back into the art world. Cause it's really where my, my true passion lies. But when he, when we actually got married on our honeymoon, he looked at me and at this time I had already quit my job. So I had already been preparing for like not working, but on our honeymoon, yeah. he looked at me and he said, I want to quit my job. Let's do it full time. <laughs> And so just another backstory is we had gotten married like right before that. And mm -hmm. I had just found out I was pregnant. So oh, I wow. was pregnant, just got married. <laughs> quit your job. I had a baby on the way, <laughs> quit my job. And then my husband was like, we're doing it. It's now or never. Knowing that our baby was on her way. Yeah. Like it was now or never. Because part of the problem that my husband had. You was, literally had like nine months. <laughs> yeah. Part of the problem my husband had was just like the fear component of like, he knew all of this. He knows how to invest mm -hmm. He's been doing it for other people for years, but yeah. there's that big level of fear that's just stopping everybody from just jumping in. And so he looked at me, I'll never forget it. He was reading Tim Ferriss's the four hour work week yep. we were in the Bahamas. And he just was like, we should do this now and it was at the very end of october so he gave when he got back from our honeymoon he gave his job which was he was working for a real estate investment firm as the head acquisition manager so he was still doing mm -hmm. what we're kind of doing now but working for somebody else and so he gave them their notice that by thanksgiving he would no longer be working yeah. there and um we kind of just took the last part of 2014 or 2015 just to like chill and figure out what our plan was because it was about a month later Christmas mm -hmm. and Thanksgiving was at that time. So there was a lot going on. And so January 1st of 2016 is when we took off and we actually mm -hmm. bought our first property December 31st of 15. So we bought our, pro our wow. first property like ahead of <laughs> schedule a little bit, but 
I didn't know anything. I had to jump in very quickly. I mm -hmm. read a lot of books. I did every seminar with him before the baby came. And it was just on the hunt for wholesale deals and private money, really. Okay. So what was your, so at that time, at that time specifically, what was your like kind of first role within real estate then? What was it then kind of helping find the deals? It sounds like. At the beginning, to be fair, to be very honest, he did a lot of it. So I, yeah. I by him, by me quitting my job, my salary paid job, which is all I've ever known to mm -hmm him quitting his commission job I was like oh my gosh I have no idea how we're gonna make money and you're pregnant and, and you I'm know pregnant. yeah it's <laughs> it was really scary but I was actually really excited at the same time because we both had been working yeah. so much that we like rarely saw each other so and we work really well together for those of y'all who do know us we're just we're very compatible we just have fun together yeah. and um what he These is very complimentary skill sets which I yeah, think is really cool he's weak and I'm actually strong in so um at the beginning he kind of just told me what to do and I was like his little secretary like oh all the things you <laughs> want to do or don't have time to do I'll do and um, it kind of just worked out but then like I said I did a lot of reading I ended up taking my real estate uh, licensing classes so as soon as I got my license he let his license go and he'd been an agent for like 10 years but he let us go because wow. it didn't make sense for us to have both of us doing the same yeah. thing paying double the fees when we're all we're making the same money so he just yeah. gave me every lead and then I would go and be the agent for them so I I That's learned a lot that. through those classes and yeah. then honestly just over time just all the transactions we got I would close them so I learned a lot of the title process and okay I know how to do wholesale transactions the market ready transactions and then our own investments it's all different slightly different mm -hmm. but they're all basically kind of the same at the same time. Okay. So and then I'm, what happened? I was just gonna say, say, I mean, I don't really know. I it's just weird. Where I'm like in my sixth year and I'm just like, <laughs> wow, it's just like a whirlwind. I don't know how exactly I just it honestly it was just by doing, to be completely fair. There wasn't one thing that I did, it was just all the things over all the years. Yeah. And it sounds, but sometimes that's the best way to learn. And you know, we've kind of talked about this in other in other podcast episodes that none of us really like. We didn't have like high school training for bookkeeping. We talked about one of the other episodes for how to how to buy a house, for how to be involved in real estate. Like these are not things that like, you know, we're not taught about like in, even in higher education in college, right? right? So honestly, a lot of this real estate investing, one of the reasons that there are so many podcasts like Lady Landlords and so many groups like us, it's because we need to find that education outside of kind of traditional means. Right. And honestly, it's one of the great things to do. And you hear this being recommended rather often is find somebody that you can kind of help out, find somebody that's kind of in the direction where you want to be going, see what you can do for them right. and learn kind of on, on the job, if you will. Once again, it's not your job, but it is a great way to be able to pick up the skills and kind of piece all those things together. And I think that's actually probably one of the things that's helped you so much is that you actually got to do so many different parts of the process that that really helped you be able to kind of learn and get you up to speed so much faster. Exactly. Yep. And then we just do a lot of, well, obviously before the pandemic, we did a ton of networking mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, honest, I mean, it's really just for me, it's the networking. I love meeting people. Yeah. Because I, I want to help everybody get to where I am if they're, if they, if they are not there yet. And I want to be able to learn from other people because I never want to be the smartest person in the room. If I, that's exactly. I'm in the wrong room. So I yes. love to meet people that have, that are doing more than I'm doing that are, you know, maybe that they have the skill sets of, that I would like to learn. So, um, I, I know that the learning is always supposed to be there. So for me, networking is key. And honestly, a lot of it was just going out, meeting people and mm -hmm. kind of doing that with my husband, he already knew a lot of people. So, I mean, there was an aspect of like, I'm the wife and like, <laughs> I'm just like the sidekick, but no, like, I think I've over especially this last year of 2020 like he's taken a major step back on social media like he used to be yeah all over social media and like the face of our wholesale company Hilco and I was just there they were like oh you still work there and I'm like yeah I mean I did have two kids during all this but um yeah he's yes, been present but this is kind of like my time to shine a little bit with my yeah. team that I'm creating and building and it's been really fun no, and that's really interesting because clearly when you and I met, once again, through some type of networking somewhere on the internet here, 
um, you know, it was, I knew of you. I didn't know of, I didn't know of Marco at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I like kind of, groups. but yeah, exactly. He's, he's not, not allowed, allowed in Lady, no Lady. Boys he's allowed. not allowed in Lady, nope, not allowed in Lady Landlord. So, you know, I think that really kind of has been like a nice kind of flip-flop to, to your business and to your relationship. And when I, you know, when I look at your social media profile, like I said, I see you and I see women and I see empowerment. And I think that's really kind of cool that you found your voice in a field that maybe he introduced you to, mm -hmm. but he didn't make you good at what you do. You did that. Yeah. So I think that's really kind of cool that you guys were able to find and complement each other well, and then really kind of create something. So one of the things that I did want to talk to you um, about today, because I know it's a very big part of what you do is work is, is private lending. So right. can you tell the group here because I feel like there's a lot of confusion between what private lending is and what private lending is not. <laughs> so yeah, there is a lot you, of confusion. So let's put all the confusion to rest. Can you please just tell us what private lending is? Let's first define what it is. Okay, so it's it's pretty simple. Private lending is getting money from somebody you know. That could be a family member, a friend, mm -hmm. an old acquaintance church connections, an old coworker, a new co I mean, anybody you personally know in your sphere, <laughs> a lot of people like to say, uh, I see it a lot actually on the, the yes. where they're like, I'm looking for private lending. And then companies will come in and say, I'm a private money lender. And I'm like, that's, you're basically no. just a private money lender. <laughs> this is why I wanted to have this here because I, I'm going to like take that sound bite out and like put it all over the place because it's something that I do in a lot of our different workshops where I try to explain that there's a very big difference between what a private lender is. So if you see PL private lender or PM private money, right? Otherwise you're thinking an HML, that is a hard money lender. Those are businesses. Those are companies. We are talking two different types of things. So ladies, when you're looking for funding, make sure that you know kind of what you're asking for. We should be, if you're going to be posting in a Facebook group, you're going to be asking for a hard money lender, because as Hillary just explained, a private lender is somebody that's in your sphere. That's somebody that you know, that's somebody that you have like some type of personal connection with, even if it is through a networking group, even if it is somebody that you do meet in lady landlords, that is a personal relationship. That is private lending. That is different than hard money lenders. So we shouldn't be writing like, Hey, who knows a private lender? Because exactly. that's. Because if somebody points you in the direction of a private lender, they're not true private lenders. Because let me give you exactly. an example of why. If somebody comes, I've had people come to me and say, hey, can you give me a private lender? And I'm like, uh, no, I will not. <laughs> because why? Because they're my private lenders. And I've, I'm the one that built that connection, built the rapport. And it's I'm a relationship. Gonna, I'm going to take the, all their money for my deal. I will never share my private money lenders. So if somebody points you in the direction of a private money lender, it's likely that it's just a company where there's yes. going to be rules, there's going to be their own set terms, there's going to be points or fees that you have to pay them versus a private mm -hmm. money lender. When, whenever I do a deal with my people, they pay 100% mm -hmm. of the deal. They pay for the sales price of the home. So whatever the contract says at the end of the day, when we go to the closing table, they pay for that. They pay for all my closing costs and they pay me for rehab. So if the rehab is 40 grand, I actually walk away from closing with a 40 grand check or a wire yeah. in my pocket. I mm -hmm. negotiate those terms with them. Um, it's a, it's a give and take. They might want higher interest, but I can't do higher interest on this particular deal. So I'll pay like a bonus on the back end. So they'll get three or four or whatever that number is that, that works for both of us. And it's, it's truly a nego negotiable conversation where um, it's give and take. And I also try and let everybody know, like a lot of times us as investors put the private money lenders above us, like, oh, like they, they're, they're the ones in control. But, and the reality is, is we need each other because if it yes. was us investors finding the deals for our private money lenders, their money would not be going to work. So it's like a partnership. It's a true partnership. They bring the funds, they act as the bank you treat them like royalty. You never miss that <laughs> payment ever. I was telling Becky about this the other day. You never miss that payment ever, um, mm -hmm. but you do all the work. So it is a true partnership because the private yeah. money are truly passive getting that mailbox money every single month. But a private money company is not pri true private money. That is just another hard money lender. 
masking mm -hmm. themselves as a private money lender. Yes. So some ways definitely know that. And listen, there's nothing wrong with a hard money lender. We're going to have a hard money lender on another episode. It is a different strategy, but I just really want to make sure that we are all clear from an education kind of standpoint, the difference between a hard money lender and a private money lender. So one of the good way, one of the ways that you would know this, once again, if you are talking to somebody that you do not know, <laughs> they are most likely a hard money lender, not a private money, not a private lender. Um, if they are saying, well, this is what our interest rate is. These are our requirements. This is kind of it that is probably going to be a hard money lender that is not a private lender because then that's really because as a private lender there's going to be a conversation about how this is going to work and how things kind of look and how it works for both parties rather than a hard money lender which once again is a business you're not going to go into i'm trying to think of a universal store macy's you're not going to go into macy's and be like hey i want this shirt but I don't want it for 10 bucks. Well, Macy's like a hard money lender is gonna say, we're a business, like it's 10 bucks, like it's take it or leave it. That's what we offer. That's how hard money lenders work. They have a, they have deep pockets, yes, but they have a set of guidelines that they follow and they don't have as, they don't have really any flexibility compared to a private lender that would and where there's terms that can be, that can be discussed. And once again, it has to work for both parties, but we wanna make sure that those are, those are different. So if you're looking for funding and you're going to a Facebook group for it, you should really be asking for a hard money lender. Otherwise, one of the great things to always do and one of the best ways to to use any Facebook group is always just to provide value. Let people know what you're looking for, let people know what you do, and you'll be able to build relationships from that. And then that's where that private men, private lending conversations come from. When you write, when you kind of find the right people and you get into that conversation and you have that relationship and you have trust, that's then where business deals are really made. So keep that in mind, everybody. I will say another thing is with hard money, like you had mentioned with the business, they, they mm -hmm. don't really care about, well, I'm not saying they don't care about you as a person. That's not what I mean. I mean, like they care about the numbers. Do you have the, yeah. do you have the money? How do you have your income? It's a very strict guideline, like Becky said, versus like a private money lender, like my private money lenders, it's 100% built on our reputation, on the trust that my husband and I have built over several years. Some of these private money lenders, Marco's known for 15 years that yeah. tired of being their own landlords, but they still want their money to go to work. So it's truly about the relationship where um, like I, they, none of them have ever pulled our credit. I mean, we have great credit, but like, they don't say, oh, you have to have stellar credit. It's literally like, do you trust us with your hundred grand? Um, mm -hmm. let's try it once. If we succeed, which we always have, if we succeed mm -hmm. on this deal, then the expectation is going forward. We can continue to reuse your money, which all of our private money lenders have been repeat people. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've never missed a payment after all these years with all these properties and we're very streamlined in how we do it but yes a private money lender is going to be somebody you've built rapport with they care about you on a personal level you care about them on a personal level hard money again it's great that's a great strategy for people mm -hmm. it's a way to get funds for flipping i mean there's so much use out of hard money it's just not the strategy that we have chosen to go down we really value the private money um, mm -hmm. but I do know some amazing hard money lenders. So if you need one, exactly. I have one for you. Exactly. And, and once again, this goes back to making sure that we have different tools in our toolbox to be able to use. So if you could, in our last couple of minutes here, can you share one tip that would help a person that is looking to become a lender? Let's say there's somebody out there listening to the show, they have some money and they're kind of like, I don't really know even how to get involved in this. How do I even become a private lender? Right. What do I do? What would be the one suggestion you'd have for that person? So for the people that have the capital, but they don't know what to do with it, I definitely advise finding somebody similar to myself or other, other invest, investors that you trust, that you see that they're doing it. You can see their history, um, especially people who have a history because um, then you can go and ask for their references. So mm -hmm find the individuals. These networking groups are great. Be careful though, because there are people that don't have experience. I'm not saying those are not, obviously somebody had to take a chance on us, right? Like we started from somewhere. Everyone had to start somewhere. Yeah. Actually my fit, one of my favorite quotes ever. And I always remind myself is every master was once a disaster. So like literally uh -huh. anybody in a great position, in a position where they are professional, they know their whatever topic it is that they know they at one point did not know it at all so just be mindful of where you're putting your money do a lot of networking 
that is key is find out who you're going to be lending to find out the terms like there has to be a process that of the person you're going to lend to don't just go don't just wire a hundred thousand dollars like ask the process ask a ton of questions get on these networking mm -hmm. groups and find out what questions should i ask a person that i want to invest with make sure you have those thorough interviews with these people so that um, your money is protected because at the end of the day, to be successful, you have to, it's, it's all based on trust. You have to find the individuals like myself and I'm, there's other people out there that will take your money, put it to work and they will not lose you money. Now, of course, re real estate, there's always a risk, but the true mm -hmm. people to, that you're going to want to work with are going to be the ones that go above and beyond to not lose your money. So yes, do your yeah, due diligence. Do and that comes to any investment, do your due diligence, do your homework. And one little tip that I'll kind of add here that you kind of talked about a little bit that I love to highlight, especially as a women's group, listen to your gut. I think one of the things that set us apart so much differently as women is we just have that little bit of a stronger innate feeling in our gut. So if your gut's saying this just isn't the right person for me, I don't like how this sounds, something sounds wrong, something sounds off, listen to your gut. And really kind of follow that through. But if your gut's saying like, hey, this makes sense. I've done my homework. I've asked my questions. I've gone through things. I've gotten answers that make me feel comfortable. I like this person. I trust this person. Then like, okay, then you can kind of go, go ahead and move forward. But I think we don't, especially in, in this business, we don't always kind of listen to what ourselves are being told. And I always think that just women have such an amazing ability um, with, with what our gut is telling us to do that I just wanted to throw that out there to really make sure because that really sets the difference between, you know, kind of that scam artist versus a really great opportunity that you might miss by getting kind of caught a little bit, as we talked about earlier, a little bit caught up in your fear of not moving forward. So trust in yourself, get the education, get your answers, question, get your questions answered, and then feel confident to be able to move forward. I want to add one little thing too, is Go just ahead. to add on to that. Um, to also like we do a lot of zoom calls with people or if they're in san antonio here we'll meet in person and we will do as many zoom calls as many phone calls <laughs> many in person to make you feel comfortable um and we know that it, it might be a longer building relationship to where i might know somebody who has money that's interested but i'm not going to just assume in that first conversation they're gonna be like okay here's money like it's a process <laughs> so we do a lot of seed planting mm -hmm. we get a lot of no's we're okay with the no's because we're just gonna hit you up in six months and say are you ready now, are you ready now? <laughs> um it, it does it is a little awkward um at first to have that conversation with somebody talking about money can be a little awkward but it, it truly is a win-win for both sides so if you can find mm -hmm. the people you trust have as many conversations as it takes to get comfortable and you can put your money to work and see your money grow really. So actually Hillary, I'm going to give you homework. There is a book called go for no. Okay. It's literally like 60 pages long. You could probably read it in an hour, but it talks all about that idea of instead of going out there and this would be this, this applies to anybody listening to this that is looking for deals or knocking on doors or driving for dollars, whatever you want to call it. The idea of go for no is if someone's, if you need to go out and you need to find a deal, right? You are really just waiting for one person to say yes. Same thing. You're waiting for private money. You're waiting to find that deal. You just need one person to say yes. Instead, if you think about it is how many no's do you want to get? Do you know how many yeses you might get? If you set a goal that you're going to knock on doors until 20 people tell you no, well, maybe you found two people that said yes. You didn't stop at one. You kind of want that little extra mile and you actually ended up with more positivity, more commission, more deals, more private money coming in, whatever it could be. When you think about it in terms of actually having people tell you no, because every no gets you closer to another yes. Mm -hmm. So, so, true. so that's your book. Yeah, um, I right. just it done. <laughs> Last question then for let's flip to the other side for a person that is looking to use a private lender. And I think we've actually kind of gotten your answer through this, but I want to be really, really clear. For all the people out there that are listening, that are looking for money, what tip or suggestion would you give them about finding money from a private lender? So first, the first thing I'll say is put the fear aside because nobody likes asking people for money. Believe me, there was, there's always that mental block of they're going to say no, or that person has no money or aunt, 
June or whatever, Aunt Sally has no money. You have no idea people's financials. You don't really know. They could mm -hmm. have a stash saved under the mattress. You have no idea. So what we tell everybody to do is what I typically do when I'm trying to like find people to like message or whatever about anything real estate related. I truly, I'll go through my Facebook friends. I start there and I literally just go down the list and I make a long list of like, okay, we're going to talk to that, this person or this person or this person. I make my list. My husband and I reach out, uh, see if they're, the key is find out, are they interested in private money or private lending? If they are, you want to find out how much do they have? Those are the key elements. If they say no, okay, they just get a follow-up day like any other thing in real estate. Follow-up mm -hmm. is key in anything real estate, whether that's retail, whether that's flipping, I mean, anything. Anything in sales. Key, exactly, or sales in general. Yeah, exactly, sales, not just real estate, but follow-up is key. So everybody gets a follow-up day, even if they're no's. We, we get a ton of no's, but they <laughs> always turn around at some point to a yes. I will, ex I will say that. <laughs> and um, after that, it's really just finding out how much they have, how much, uh, when do they want to look, and then we just put them in an email blast and send out deals that showcase what we're looking for or what we're trying to raise money for. Um, mm -hmm. Write out your list, make the calls, message people, find out if they're willing to do it, keep the communication. Networking, again, is key. A lot of our day is calling people, messaging people just building that rapport. We go out to lunch a lot with people that we're building the relationships with and, and targeting for private money. Um, and, it, and it's not, again, it's not, it's not like we're sharks just pouncing for the money. It's really truly to build the relationship because I might not be getting money from somebody for years, but I wanna build that relationship just because we're about, this is a relationship business. So yeah. for, for us, it's the long-term game, not the short-term. So if somebody says no to me now, it's not like I'll never talk to them again or they're written <laughs> off. No, like you're gonna still hear from me and it's gonna still be a relationship. So I go through my social media, I pull names from there. I connect with people. Networking is key. Even if with COVID right now, things are shut down still like crazy after a year. But get on the Facebook groups. Like I'm always on Lady Landlords. I'm sure some of you have seen me. I'm not super active in like posting like the main status, but I'll post a lot to people's questions. And You're so, always answering people's questions. Yeah, and I will answer that goes back to providing value to people. Exactly. If I can see, um, if I see something that I, I happen to be on social media at that time, and I see a question that I can easily answer, I will jump in and and be of use and of service yeah. to people because if I know it, I want to help and give what I know. Um, so I'm just in, involved as many networking groups as I can be in person, online. I I try and reach out once a week and have lunches with with at least a, a woman that I admire once a week. Um, and it's really just That's the beautiful. Honestly, I just can't I can't express enough the networking and the fear component. Like you just have to get through the fear. Just be okay asking and pe be okay getting no's because you're going to get a lot of no's, but do not let it stop you from asking again and continuing asking. I think no, I think that's important. People. people get scared. It's kind of like cold calling. People hate it, so they just don't do it. Well, you're never going to get a deal if you don't do it. You just have to push yourself into an uncomfortable place and you will eventually get a yes. And the first yes you get, mm -hmm deal you successfully do it's just like a it's like a snowball effect like you just keep getting more yeses and more yeses and more yeses and like me mm -hmm. my husband and I we've raised three and a half million dollars for our private money and every single property we've ever bought has been 100 private money not a dollar of mine has gone into it and when you can profit mm -hmm. when they win and you win and everybody wins it's like a beautiful thing and Truly, you just got to get the first yes, and then that will really set you off for future success. No, you're absolutely right. And really kind of just getting that first one done, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something role play with somebody, practice with somebody, um, come into the Lady Landers group and make a post and say, hey, I think I'm going to, you know, send this to somebody on my friends list. Like, how does this message look? And we can look it over and say like, okay, okay this, you know, is a, a great way to write it. Hey, maybe change this word, change that word. Like we can absolutely be your sounding board. Um, and also, I guess this will be a good time to remind people as well that we do have the Lady Landlords um, monthly networking meetings. Um, those are virtual right now due to COVID. So great opportunity there to see who you can kind of meet and network with and really build those relationships outside of the Facebook group. Um, so always head over and check out um, when our upcoming date is for that. 
Hillary, any last words, any last tips or piece of advice that you'd like to share? Just try not to let the fear get you. I, I mean, it can be scary. Yeah. This can be a very intimidating, we're in a very intimidating business, especially with it being more male dominated. Um, just as for us women, we got to stick together. Just, of course, you're going to, it's going to be hard sometimes, but you just have to keep going and move forward. And it's okay to get no's. It's okay to be scared, but we just have to like push ourselves into the uncomfortable spot. And mm -hmm. honestly, I think it's really just like being a yes person, like saying yes to things that make us uncomfortable because that's where we truly grow. And that's mm -hmm. honestly when you as a person start to grow. And I don't know, it's just, I feel like when I made the decision to just stop letting fear kind of dictate my life, like I, it's crazy the person I feel like I'm becoming because it's, I feel, it's like, I love who I am becoming and I know I'm not where I really want to be, but I'm every day I'm working towards that. And so it's really just pushing through it and doing the things that make us uncomfortable. And you're one step closer every single day. Exactly. So by taking that action. So every, no, that's, yep. that's absolutely beautiful. I think that's a great reminder. So Hillary, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us about private lending. I really appreciate it okay. and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Becky. You too. Bye.